When I was prompted to write my book, The Economics of Happiness, my students who were traumatized by economics, and most of us have been, wanted me to write this down in terms of defining the real origins of the language of economics and to imagine a new dream, a dream what I call building an economy of well-being and a civilization of love. Yes, you heard an economist say love. The dream I have, I'm a former mountain climber, is to conquer a new mountain, to examine the current economic system, which is actually in free fall right now, and to reimagine an economy that's based not on economic growth, but more on well-being returns on investment. In the book, The Economics of Happiness, which was published in 2007, I defined a roadmap in, that, in which we could develop and build this economy of well-being. And on the cover is a Fibonacci sequence, which is a foundation of accounting. And it is the whole basis of what Leonardo da Vinci and Luca Pazzioli, the father of accounting, explored. In each flower, in each nautilus shell, you can see the Fibonacci sequence, the golden mean. And that is the whole basis of accounting. I've had the ple pleasure of working with the Chinese government, helping them design Chao Kang measures of well-being. Chao Kang is a Confucian term that means a society of moderately well-off Chinese. The Chinese, I think, not are, only are in the enviable role of being the dominant economic power in the world today, but actually could stand on the precipice of being the first well-being economy. Economics, as I teach my business students at the U of A, is about household stewardship. That's what it means in the Greek. So we're all economists in the truest sense. And every household needs a CHO, a chief happiness officer, and that's Jen, my wife. And we have two girls who are care holders. So every household is an enterprise attached generally to a business, which was the original vision of Luca Pazzioli in 15th century Italy when he was advising Venetian business people about how to manage their well-being. The purpose of our life, the Buddha said, is to be happy. But happiness is an important term that we need to properly locate in the Greek understanding. Aristotle said happiness means oidemonia, which in Greek means well-being of the spirit. So this is the fundamental basis of happiness, is actually the integrity of our internal spirit the reason why we're here on this planet, to get in touch with our vocation, that inner voice. Thomas Jefferson said, without virtue, happiness cannot be. I believe societies are partly awash and, and listless because they have forgotten the virtues of Plato, which were courage, moderation, wisdom, and just, justice. The uh, king of Bhutan and the prime minister of Bhutan, uh, Bhutan is a the first country to have gross national happiness as its national policy. This, I believe, will be the, the framework for other nations. Instead of pursuing just constant GDP growth, we will actually be optimizing happiness, and we will elect our officials, our, our representatives, on this basis of have they created the conditions for the optimization of happiness and happy lives lived. My Aboriginal friends have taught me that we are constructed of four aspects, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. Our medicine wheel, if you like, spins clockwise through time, through the center, through those crosshairs called volition. If part of the wheel is in balance, then we are in balance, and so is our world in balance, just like the tire in your car. Turns out that happiness follows the happiness curve through life. It's highest when you're young. Uh, you start going into the trough around puberty. Just when you start to go into junior high, and our young singer here was uh, reminding us that you start to lose a sense of why you're here. Most of us have forgotten our dream. We put it in the closet when we were eight years old. And it, so the happiness, self-rated happiness curve actually declines all the way through uh, until you're about 45, 50 years old, and then maybe you start to climb out of that trough. Uh, it just happens that... The, when you climb out is probably when you finish paying off your mortgage, which in French means a death pledge. <laughs> this is the father of accounting, Luca Pazzioli, and his benefactor, the Duke of Florence. So this guy was a mathematician. He was a Capuchin monk, uh, and he's a very interesting and smart guy. I could go on forever about this guy. This is my work with the Inuit. So all the pictures I'm showing you are portraits of, of the work I've done and places I've been. 
Robert Kennedy said, are we measuring what matters? If we're not measuring what matters in terms of the joy of our children's play, then why are we measuring anyways? And we have to ask ourselves, why do we keep account anyways? In a study that a team of my, my team in Pemina Institute in 2001 released a report that looked at the overall uh, change in the economic progress of Alberta compared to an index of well-being called a gender and progress index. And we showed that the index had actually declined even as GDP rose. So the rising tide of GDP has not been lifting all the well-being boats of, of the province. Even Joseph Stiglitz now, economists fortunately are actually getting into the happiness field. They're acknowledging that since World War II, since we've had this accounting system, we have actually been failing to measure the things really that matter to people. And if we fail to measure the things that we connect with in terms of our values, then how can we be confident that we're having genuine progress? If we map happiness and GDP, we can see that there's a, maybe an optimization point, somewhere around 10 to 20,000 dollars per capita. Alberta's way out on the limb, way out where Luxembourg is. And you have to ask ourselves, could we actually optimize happiness at a lower output of GDP? And I think the answer is quite possible. We might actually have to work less and therefore have more time, which is the most precious of things. In the science of happiness, there are three key determinants of happiness. The first, 50%, is your upbringing, the quality of your childhood. So we can spend a lot more time spending time with our children, ensuring that when they go to school, they actually achieve a true education. The word education means in Latin, to be, to draw forth from what already is within yourself. So 50% is just the conditions of, of well-being that we experience as children. Only 10% of our happiness is derived from our level of income and the education we enjoy. And the best news of all is that 40% of our well-being comes from our relationships with each, with each other. We are relational beings. And the more we get together, the happier we'll be, says the song. And I think we all agree. There are recent studies of the happiest cities in Canada. The happiest city in Canada right now is Trois-Rivières, Quebec, and the saddest city is Toronto. Uh, the gap between them isn't that large, and Edmonton and Calgary sit somewhere in the middle. Well, what are the determinants of the happiest cities? The, uh, the most important determinant or factor is a sense of belonging to your community. If relationships are the most important aspect of personal well-being, then a sense of belonging to community is the most important factor for community well-being. The second most important factor is perceived mental health. The third is physical activity. Uh, the fourth is st our levels of stress. The fifth is being married, and, which is a good thing. Uh, the sixth is actually being a recent immigrant. Uh, this is why it's lower in Toronto, because you have a higher new immigrant population. So it, it's incumbent on us, if we're relational creatures, to make sure that our, our newcomers to this country have a sense of belonging to the community. Being unemployed is a real killer of happiness as well. So I've come up with a model called genuine wealth. It means to live authentically according to the values that we hold in our hearts. Uh, if we're not measuring those things that we value most, then we're missing the boat, so to speak. And the word wealth from the old English means the conditions of well-being. So this changes everything, in my opinion. There are five capitals of genuine wealth. Uh, human capital, which is people and our skills and dreams. And there's social capital, which is our relationships, our trust, our sense of belonging to our neighborhoods, to our community. The uh, third attribute is natural capital, which is everything nature already provides for free, which ironically doesn't, doesn't sit on anyone's balance sheet, the provincial or federal governments or municipal governments. And the fourth is built capital. The fifth, of course, is financial capital. And this is the most interesting one because money is actually literally created at thin air. If you understand money, it is not related to any of the other four capitals. So this gives us a great opportunity to design a new system. I take data and I present it in, in shapes of flowers. The Chinese call me the flower man, and this is a flower that we created for the city of Edmonton to guide their budgeting and decision making. If this flower for Edmonton were perfect, if every petal in the flower were ideal, then every of the 50 well-being indicators would be optimized. But that's never the case and probably will never be. But this is a way of sort of visualizing uh, a new balance sheet of well-being. 
Then I can imagine clusters, bouquets of flowers from the individual level to the household uh, and even businesses who would have their own five capital accounts in a sense and all integrated into the big flower. That's the flower up there for the city of Leduc that I developed in 2006. My 85-year-old friend who beat leukemia 20 years ago by changing his lifestyle, Oris Andre, said, we need to renew our attitude of gratitude. Every day that we have, every moment we breathe is an opportunity to pursue the dream that we were born, born into. Lewis Cardinal, a good Aboriginal friend of mine, said, every child born is an answer to a prayer. So what is the prayer that we're here to answer? If you want the secret of happiness, it was in a Chinese tea bag that I saw the other day and said, to want, what you already, to want what you already have and to live the life you've already been given. Most of us have put our dream in the closet and we wait far too long to realize why we're here. Mother Teresa, I think, said it best, as much as I get hired to measure progress, love does not measure, it just gives. And that's the truth. And my vision is that we can not just build an economy of well-being, but a civilization of love. That will require a renewal of our relationship with each other, with the Creator, and with the land, in a way that we're wiser stewards, we're true economists. John Ruskin, the great English philosopher, said, there is no life, no wealth, but, sorry, no wealth but life, life including all, all the, the fruits of joy and of love. Finally, I think we can imagine and dream a new mountaintop. I have just been invited to be an advisor to the Tahitian government, Tahiti. I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, we might be able to design the first well-being economy in the world, a country of 260,000 people, whose kauri shells, the shells that the Cree people and Aboriginal people used here before contact, before the Hudson's Bay Company, those shells came from the South Pacific into this theater, they were used as a means of exchange. And we, as newcomers to this place, don't even know that story. Thank you. <laughs>